<laughs> exactly. It goes like this. I play every single tune, I say every hymn book, every every hymn in that tune I could play on this, man. I can't play an instrument, I can play on this, amen. Drives my wife crazy, amen. Give me a minute to wrestle with my favorite toy. It's been a blessing to be here. If you would open up your Bibles tonight. Open your Bibles tonight to the Haggai chapter 2 and then Zechariah, the next book over there, chapter 4. That's the Minor Prophets. Haggai chapter 2, I'm going to read a little Bible here, and then we'll go over to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1 verse in Zechariah, we've got about six, 7 or 8 here in Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, verse 1, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jozadek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jozadek, the high priest, and be strong, O ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I'll, and I'll shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of former, saith the Lord of hosts. In this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. One, one book over, fourth chapter. Verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand as rubbable with those, with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Brother Black, would you pray? Brother, Brother White, would you pray?
Now, what's going on here in these two books here, first you read it in Haggai, and you read it over here now in Zechariah, is that there's the, uh, the Jews of the dispersion have been called back by God to come back into Israel and go back into the cities of Judah. And what he's got there is he's got Zechariah and he's got Haggai out there preaching to the remnant that's coming back in the land. And he gives a strong message here, both in Haggai, both in Haggai and Zechariah. And he tells them to the Jews, he tells Zechariah, I want you to go down there and I want you to encourage my people and I want you to go in there and I want you to help them and show them the work that I want to get done. But I want you to just start preaching to them and encourage them in a way of my way. Over there, the Zechariah gets the command and he goes in there and there's a bunch of builders. And there's some people there and there's this guy, Zerubbabel, who's a master carpenter, master craftsman there. And he's out there and he, over there he finishes the temple. By the way, that's the latter. The former shall be what? The latter shall be better than the former. And he's over there and he's building and he finishes the construction of the temple foundation there. And God wants him over there to finish that. And then over here in Zechariah, if you, over there in chapter 10 of chapter 4, verse 10, because it's a small work and because there's not big glander, because Solomon doesn't have his big temple anymore, because the gates are broken down in Jerusalem, because the city kind of still lays in destruction, there's not a lot going on, but there's some ambitious people. If the Lord can just get them going again and get them back into the fight and get them back into the race, then that much will be better with the small. And what goes on here is Zechariah is out there and he's preaching. And he tells the people there, by the word of the Lord, for who hath despised the day of small things? This is a small work, amen, comparatively speaking, to great bigger works. This is small work. You know, one of the things you've got to look at back here in, uh, in Haggai chapter 2, Haggai chapter 2, if you come back there, the promise that the Lord gives, In verse 9, if you look down there, the, pretty towards the end of the verse. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. This place is well, this place is Jerusalem. That's where the temple is going to be done. That's where it's going to be complete. And that's where Jesus Christ is going to come back and reign. And that's why there's so much tribulation and turmoil going on right now. It's because of this one city. It's because of this one town. It's because of a place on this earth which is the center of the, of the world. And there's a lot going on with that because God Almighty is going to come back and He's going to sit on that throne one day. You don't read much in the media really about the other cities of the world. They may have uh, even New York up there. You don't read much about San Francisco and you don't read much about you know, Los Angeles or Cleveland for that matter. You don't live, read much about Miami. They may have their things going on. You don't read much about the cities and the, and the, or in the rest of the world. But what you do see about is there's constant strife and there's constant turmoil about a city called Jerusalem. And that's the focus right now. And I believe we're in the last days. And I believe right now that God is preparing us for departure. He's preparing us to get out of here. The world is looking for peace. That's what it's all about. I mean, right now in Yankee Stadium today, live footage, I walked into my hotel room and there they had the big economical. Those were the Protestants. They had, they had the Jews there. They had the Arabs there. They had the Muslims. They had every sect of every denomination. They probably had 15 different Christian denominations. They probably even had some Baptists there. I'm not getting on Baptist, but I'm just letting you know what the world is coming to right now. Now, the world wants peace, and that's what it's going to want. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to get taken out of here, and the, anti, the man of anti-peace is going to come in here. And they're going to accept him gladly. And so the world, while the world looks for peace, the, God, the Lord God in heaven has instructions for us today to despise not the day of small things. And it's so easy to do that. Because it's just our natural way of looking at things. It's just, it's just the way we're, perhaps we're trained up from a child. 
It's the way that we're brought up in a home. It's the way, perhaps, that others look at us and what we expect of others. And we can't get this concept down about what God... God's not always in the big things, but He starts out with the small things. The charge is the small things. Over there in Romans chapter 12, turn there to the book of Romans... Chapter 12. Now look in verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, your faith, when you receive your faith, it's a small thing. It's the beginning. It's a small thing. Some of you hit the ground running in the Christian life. And I think that was what my, one of my things. I hit the ground running. I came into the faith at 26 years old. I was tired of the old life and whatever encompassed the old life. And I hit the ground running. And I don't ever want to go back. But sometimes when you hit the ground running, you forget that you were given a measure of faith. And it's small. And it's not big. Jesus said it's a mustard seed, amen? Mustard seeds are not big. They're small. But the problem today is people don't want small things. You better get note of that. The Christian life does not begin with a whirlwind with a fire. Christian life begins with one verse at a time. It begins with... Uh, Bow on your knee in the morning. It begins at being thankful for what you get. That's a small thing. It begins at appreciating your wife. And your wife appreciating your husband. The pressures that he's going through. And the devil's on his back all the time. And God doesn't ask a lot of you, but what he does ask is the small thing that he asks you to do and obey. Men despise small things. They despise men everywhere. Our calling in general, if you look at what we represent, is a small thing. If you could compare what our calling would be to men's standards, it'd be very, it'd be very small. And you know, some of us, we want to start out the race, we want to start out running, and we want that, that seed to be much bigger than the, what God really gives. He gives a measure of faith to everybody that comes in. The brother was talking about people who are on different spiritual levels. The seeds are not, the seeds are small, but some seeds have grown, amen, and other seeds are still germinating. They're still getting watered, amen. And they see, and, and if they're not careful, they're gonna end up despising where they're at. Because they're, you're so busy breathing down their neck about the level of spirituality where they need to be. They need to be where God wants them to be. I came down here, I had maybe 10 months of Bible under my belt. I sat under a local church here came down here, I was just beginning in the faith, just brand new. And when I got married, I didn't know anything about being married. I didn't know what the word commitment was. God said commitment. I said, what's that? Take care of somebody. I don't know how to take care of anybody. I don't know how to take care of myself. <laughs> and God asked you to do these little things. Amen. You say, but I take those things for granted. You can't take them for granted. Because God's in those little things. God's not going to give you something big until you fulfill that which is small. You're not going to get, you're not going to get the Z until you get the A. By the way, B comes after A. But vice versa. You know, some of you, the problem is some of you in here tonight, you think your measure is too small. If you would just review your life, like Paul says, let every man examine himself to see whether he'd be in a faith. He'd realize that, you know what? You were, get, you were given a short hand. You were given a short stack. Hey, you were given oversight. God gave you, you God did you wrong. You got something to bitter, you got something to murmur about. Because you're not happy with what God, the measure that God has given to you. You don't become perhaps a brother Jant with, with the jail ministry he has by just start getting into the jail ministry. It's a level of time and a level of growth that God brings you through that thing. Hey, listen, before honor 
is what? Humility. What? Humility. humility. And there's a little humility sometimes. God has to chisel his people down a little before he builds them back up. And it's a measure of faith. It's a small thing, and you've got to be careful not to despise it. And then there's soul winning, and there's street preaching, and then there's our service that we offer to our God and to our Lord. And you get out there in the street, and after a while it gets addictive. I mean, you have the confrontation, the battles, the excitement. But then there comes a time when, when it doesn't get exciting. There comes a time when it becomes routine. And God's calling you to private study. And you're not listening to private study. Listen, don't despise the fact that you can't go by what you measure. You can't go by what you see. You don't know that the seeds that you plant aren't going to have eternal rewards in heaven. You can't measure your influence now. But at the judgment seat of Christ, look out. Some of you say, I just can't see what I'm doing. And I'm getting so discouraged about the lack of results. Every pastor in here and every minister goes through that. The brothers here that are sitting here that are pastors, they'll tell you. They go through that all the time. And you're going to go through that all the time. You even go through that when you're here. You go through school, you can't lead a soul to Christ. I, I was hard for me. Three years of visitation, I led one to Christ. I mean, I knocked on every door. Every time of visitation, I went where I was supposed to go and did what I was supposed to do. Had a great, had Brother Friesen as my, prayer, uh, my visitation partner. And we went out there and we, let, we labored. We went out there. We did what we were supposed to do. But you know what I realized a few years later and stepping back in that? God was in the ministry of training you and, and bringing up that measure of faith. And just because you didn't see results in soul winning, just because you didn't see results in people getting saved and coming to church, doesn't mean that God wasn't working on you. You say, what about, what about the souls? What about it? That is a great thing, boy. I, soul winning is great. I see fruits, I see fruits of soul. When I'm out there preaching some weeks, we'll go weeks without a soul saved. We'll go, then we'll come in and we'll get three or four saved in an afternoon. You say, how many come to church? Not many. I believe we're in the last days. You say, you keep harping on that. That's because we are. How come we don't have two 2,500 church members here? With all the truth this town has and all the labor and all the door knocking, all the visitation, all the follow-up, I mean, how much more can you do? What are you supposed to do? Paint yourself a different color? And stand on your head? Grow hair? That's hard for me. What more are you supposed to do? But you know what happens? You get, you get a little bitter. You get a little angry. You know what? You just start to despise that small thing. It's just a small thing the Lord asks you to do. He doesn't ask you to do a big thing. He asks you to do a, a small thing. Listen, I had a, little, uh, I had a little nursing home minister when I was here, and I was thankful for it because it was proving grounds and training grounds for things that would be beyond had a jail ministry ministry when I was here. I'd go up there on Sunday to Atmore. I'd come back Sunday night for service. Sunday morning I was up there. It was training grounds for the things that would be hereafter. And they were used by God to develop the man. You say, where was the fruit? The fruit was being, like, brother, like the brothers preached, inside. Love, joy, meekness, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith. Against such what? There is no law. I skipped a few. But that's what it is. It's small. It's not a large thing. You know, you want to get in there and you don't think you have an effect on anybody. But you do. You talk to a guy and he contemplates for a while. I had a thing that happened down in Haiti. I went to Haiti with the brother here from uh, the, the past from Haiti, Brother Dominic. I was with him come New Year this past year. I went down there and... Sure enough, as soon as I get to the house, put my bags down, we go outside, we sit around. They're all speaking Creole, and I'm just listening. Sure enough, uh, we have people come in. Thank, thank God for Brother Maurice that's here. He's, he was exchanging a dialogue, and he was interpreting. And we had one guy that came in, and he, he came in here, and he, I just hit him right, right away with the gospel. He understood a very little bit of English, but Brother Maurice was sitting. I was talking, and Brother Maurice was interpreting. It was wonderful. It was pure tongues. The right way. And the guy looked, he was perplexed and under deep conviction. And he said, I'm going to come back. And I said, oh, here we go. One, another one of these. And he did come back. And he got saved. 
He said, I, I need what you have. I believe it. I need to get saved. He bowed his knee right there. Now, you know what that is? That's, that's one soul. It's a small thing. And you're not to despise that thing. And you can if you let numbers get in the way. Amen. Folks, numbers are not always significant to spirituality. When you start putting the book in the church and start teaching the Word of God, they start walking out the door. And you're saying, what's the matter with me? What did I do? There's nothing the matter with you, brother. Sister, stay, stay in the faith. Stay in the fight. I called a brother down there in Florida. He's a good brother. He's in the ministry tonight. I called him up one time. And he gave me some insight. He said, brother, God didn't call you perhaps to start a big work. He called you to preach. So I was wondering how come everybody's leaving. People leave, amen. They come and they go. But you know what, God? Don't get discouraged. And you can, if you don't watch that thing, you can end up despising that. And then we go over here. Not only that, we go back and you're calling. Like I had indicated earlier, you have a small calling. If there's, I don't know how many people on the earth, what are you in comparison to the people on this earth? How many people are on the earth right now? Anybody good at the math figure? Any, six billion? It's a lot of people. You say, how could God care less for me? How could I have an influence on these kind of people? And you do. God takes note of the things that he asks you to do. God takes note of you. You have an influence. You have an impact. You're calling. You don't want to despise your calling. Whatever God calls you to, I don't care if you're a street worker. I don't care if you're a soul winner. I don't care if you're a Sunday school teacher. I don't care if you're a treasurer. Whatever the thing is, and however small and finite you may think it is, to God, it's a big thing. And the world standard, what, is, what do you care about the world anyway? Jesus didn't pray for the world. He didn't pray for the world. He died for the world. He didn't pray for the world. John 17, read it. You know, I'm not worried about what Bill Gates and Don Trump think about my calling. You know, you're going to have to just put off, you know, concern. You're not going to last long if you're going to worry about what do people think of you. You're a Baptist, the least esteemed in the kind of body of Christ. And if you haven't found that out, call up your parents. They don't write you back and they don't call. My mother had told me uh, one time, we were up at a fellowship there and uh, her brothers, all three of them, nut, nuttier and nuts. <clears throat> he was such a good Catholic boy. What happened to him? My mother, a saved Christian, he's serving the Lord. She hasn't been in church in 20 years. Saved as you and me, buddy. <laughs> he's serving the Lord. They See, they despise you, but you shouldn't despise you what you're calling. Just because they despise you. Listen, Zechariah was there and he was preaching to these people who had their homes taken away from them. He had, he had, he was speaking to people who were, who were, completely destroyed from what had happened. Seventy years of chastisement. What did he say to him? He said, get going. God's in this thing. Don't look at the numbers. Don't look at all your opposition. Don't look at the laughter and don't listen to the mocking. Just keep going. And I'll take care of you. God will take care of you. You got his promise on it. You know, you're going to, some of you, when you, when you get into, uh, a malfunction there, you're going to start questioning God. You're going to start looking at God and if you don't care if you start doing this thing. I mean, what's it all about anyway? It's about your relationship with Him. It's not about anything else. Everything else is secondary. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is first. You know, I know an Old Testament prophet who had a, who got so much into the routine of things and so much into the routine of, of, of performing miracles. I mean, he chopped, hacked off 400 Baylight priests' head, Elijah by name. And he's out there swinging his sword after a while. He got kind of wearied. But he got kind of, uh, he got kind of looked at the majestic appeal of the miracles that God was doing in a mighty way. And he, and he ended up getting into this rut, this spiritual rut. And what happened with him 
was that he couldn't find God anymore. Threats come from Jezebel. And I couldn't tie Elijah's shoes. Neither could any of us. Amen. And he goes in there and the message comes that she's by this time tomorrow, you're going to be like one of them. He takes off. And he runs. And he hides out for 40 days. And he ends up and he meets, meets God at Mount Carmel. And he's up there. And God says, what are you doing here? The street vernacular. What doest thou here, Elijah? He says, oh, there's, there's none that worship any in Israel. And there's none. There's, there's only seven. Th and <laughs> there's none left in Israel that call up by your name. He says, I've reserved unto me 7,000 and have not bowed the knee to Baal. And then he goes in and he starts worrying about, about what, what, where you are. And he says, God says to him, come outside. I want to show you something, Elijah. And he takes him out. And he kind of tucks him there like he put the, you know, the gourd over Jonah. And he puts him there and he starts telling him, now I want you to look at something. And he causes a mighty wind to come up. He says, what do you see? He says, a mighty wind. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. One of those Kansas tornadoes, amen. One of those big old funnel clouds that come down, those black funnel clouds that come down. Bam! Mass destruction. Surely you're in that. No, I'm not. And he takes him over and says, come on over here, Elijah, and I want to show you something else over here. Let me, let me put you over here. And what do you see? See, uh, the earth opens up and it quakes. Rocks go down, houses, trees, boom! <laughs> oh, wow, you're in that. I mean, I mean, you're in earthquakes all the time. Didn't you swallow Dathe, Corn, of Byram? He goes, yeah, that was for their stupidity, but I'm not in that. And Elijah starts scratching his head and says, what, what? going on here and then he takes him over one more time and says let me take it back here Elijah and he takes him back here and he says I want you to look now he says okay Lord and he puts them on and he takes him sets his face straight and he goes okay and he breathes fire he says surely you're in the fire Lord well, the Lord is a consuming fire he goes yeah but I'm not in that what are you saying I'm in a still, small, quiet voice. You know what happens to some of you? You don't want to hear that still, small, quiet voice. You'd rather see the God that has all these miracles, and you'd rather see the God that has all these earthquakes. You'd rather see the God that has all these tornadoes and all these mass destructions. I'm not saying that that's what you want, but you'd be inclined in your heart, if I'm permitted to say these, You'd be inclined to see God in that fashion as opposed to something that he's doing down here. He's down here on the altars. These altars are worn out by knees over here, I see. I'm looking over here, I see these worn back, back here, prayer. Down here, right here, somebody's been praying in this spot here, doing business with God. I look over here, and that's a big old thing, man. Look at that. And I look over here, the wall, the, all the altars, that's where God does business. There's a still small quiet that comes up out of that carpet on the altar. And it's calling you by name. And it's what it's saying is, don't despise me down here. So you've got to be careful not to despise him. Because we do. You know, I know a, I know a preacher who was called out. From the wilderness, from, the, from Egypt, because he killed a man. As you heard this morning, he killed a man. He goes out 40 years in the desert and he has to come back in. He gets trained now. He's ready to go to work. You understand that God is in uh, no hurry, like you think he is, to perform somebody capable to help somebody. Back in and he leads his people back out. And they come out. And as they're going through the Red Sea, a little while goes by. Lord, they want water. This was a testing time for Moses. The Lord says to him, speak to the rock and it will bring forth this water. Here 
there, ye rebels, must we fess water out of this rock? Wa bang! And then he hits it again. Wa bang! Kicked out of the promised land. For that. That little thing? Yeah, but that was the little thing God told him to do. And he didn't, did he? He didn't. You see, what was Elijah's problem? Elijah just had vision trouble. You say, what was Moses' problem? He had heart trouble there. That's going to happen to everybody. But at some particular point in time, God's going to put His hand on you, and He's going to tell you, I, I'm going to tell you something, that just don't despise what I'm going to show you. Are you going to be happy with ten church members? No, Lord. I am looking for bigger fish to fry. Well, then you know, I'm not, I'm not going to bother with you. Come back at a more convenient time. How is he going to bless you in the, small, in the big things if he can't trust you with the small? Elijah was given a pink slip that day. God came down and handed him a pink slip. You know what that means? You're fired. Those aren't nice slips to receive. And as he's going down, he says, God has to deal with him again. He says, go to Elisha and he'll be your prophet instead of you. He goes to Moses. Moses, for that, you'll not go into the promised land. Lord, I've labored, Lord, I've labored 40 years. I'm 80 now. I can't go into the promised land. He's probably close to 120 at this point. Because you didn't sanctify me from the people. That's a small thing to ask. God doesn't ask a lot. He just asks that you just get a little sanctified. Sanctified. Father, sanctify him with thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, ancient Israel was looking for a redeemer that was going to come. They were looking for a redeemer that was going to come out of the sky. I mean, literally, they were looking for a Christ that was going to fall out of the sky and come deliver them from these Roman persecutors that were uh, persecuting them, not knowing enough that they, they got that they were turned over because of their sins, and they were looking for this magnificent Messiah to come out of the sky. Well, they had the right expectation, but at the wrong time. What, the, what did they get? They got a baby in a manger. That's what they got. They got a little baby that was born in a little stall with cattle and dung. He came in a small way. They didn't like the way he came. You say, what's that? That's a small thing. A small, that's a tiny thing. That's a thing to be, that's just a small thing, folks. A small thing. Gideon prepares for war against the Midianites in Judges chapter 7, and there's 22,000 soldiers that get prepared to go to battle. And then he says, if any of you are afraid, uh, here, if any of you were afraid, stay, stay right here. So there's only 10,000 left. And then God has to come, come down and talk and speak with Gideon. And he has to convince Gideon because I have a natural tendency to think that Gideon was not pleased in the way God was showing him this. You look over there in chapter 7 of Judges and God has to come down here and he has to talk with Gideon each time that he's taking these people away. I mean, the, 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 the soldiers get smaller and smaller and smaller. There's 300 left. And they take out the Midianites with 300. That's a small group of people that opposed to what they started with. But that was left. What am I saying here, brother, sister? What am I saying? Don't despise the day of small things. We have a funny way, the way we look at things all the time, and we can't get, we've got to get our eyes off, off of the physical. We've got to get our eyes into the eternal. We've got to look at what God has prepared for us, keeping our eyes above on Jesus Christ. Not on the things that down here that don't mean anything. You're going to leave this stuff, this church, and man, I love meeting it. It's going to burn one day. You see these seats? They're going up in the flames. You see it the organ? It's gone. Thank God we have it to minister the music to our hearts.
thank God. It's going up in flames one day. It's going to happen. Get ready. Set not your affection on things below. On the earth, where moth and rust do with corrupt. And then I'd like to say, uh, lastly, because I promised I wouldn't take a long time tonight. But lastly, this is, and most sincerely, you shouldn't despise your influence with others. I don't care who it is. Whoever it is. You have an influence. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's looking at you. First year students are looking at the third year students. You say, why? Well, the third year students have, have, have somebody that's they're looking up to. I know I, I had a lot of brothers in the third year class that I looked up to, and rightfully so. They've been through the second year, and now they're in the third year. They know how the school runs. They know the classes, how the class works. They know exactly how, well, what kind of questions to answer on a test. They know the ins and outs. They've got some wisdom. You can go and sit down with them. You can fellowship with them. Some of them are older in age, although that's not always an indicator. A lot of times it is. And you can go there, and you can see that these people actually have gleaned something from you. They have an influence. And you don't, want it to, you don't want to despise that. Because if you let yourself, you will. Hey, listen, folks. Be content with the things you have. I think this is a redundant theme, but so what? I could care less. I lived on a block in the, in the Bronx. I uh, went up there. When I started living up there, I had a neighbor that I became very fond of. Old Catholic, ex-Catholic guy. I mean, he, he reminded me of Dr. Ruckman. He, was, uh, he, was the, he had a dance. He uh, orchestrated children and had them do their marches in the, in the Catholic church. They had, the, they had a band out there, and he did it for like 35 years. You talk about commitment. I haven't met anybody like that guy in terms of commitment. And we got to talk. And of course, he used to see the bumper stickers on my back car. If you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? I like to propose a question when I witness. It gets people to think. As opposed to just having a regular thing, you can get people to ask them a question. And he came up to me and says, you know, we've had quite a stare about those uh, stickers. I said, good, it's meant to. Smiling at him. He goes, he goes uh, Henry Ken Hank Kennedy, how are you? He shook his hand. I said, Mr. Kennedy, how are you? Nice to meet you, sir. And we got pretty close. We got very close. I still keep in touch with him at times. He's still living. He's still okay. He's probably 84 years old now. But what inspired me, what, what I really liked about Mr. Kennedy was the fact that he was so open and he would always look forward to speak with me when I would come home from work. And he'd always associate me coming home, my briefcase in hand. I'm walking home and there he is. He would always greet you. And he'd always put a smile on my face. It all started because of the bumper stickers. Some of you don't have bumper stickers. That's your conviction. That's fine. Because maybe, you know, you, you want to speed and you're worried about speeding in a car and you don't want to have, you know, have a bad testimony and something, <clears throat> you know. Got to get to class. I'm doing 90. <laughs> you're smacking into a tree, but you're running out to make that class. Say, man, I'm here. Whoever's taking my attendance. I made it. Where's your car? It's wrapped around a tree. And we got to talking about the Bible, Mr. Kennedy and I. He said, uh, what Bible do you read? See, that's something you might despise. Just one person. You've got to be careful about that. That's why you're here. Jesus Christ said you're the salt of the earth. I said, I read a King James Bible. He said, oh, really? I said, I haven't read that. I said, I'll be happy to show it to you. He said, would you please? I went and got him at Schofield, man. Big print. Walked it over to his house. He had one of those World War II homes. World War II homes. It was just a flat up the top. One of those A-frame kind of things with a long flat. Had a lovely wife. Had a you know, piece of property in the back. I mean, everything paid for. He didn't believe in getting in debt, amen. He was a good Christian kind of man. He had all the makings of a great Christian. He was just missing Jesus Christ. 
And I started to witness to him, and I gave him the Bible, and he invited me in his house. We sat down, and we had a conversation. I said, uh, Mr. Kennedy, have you ever received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? He goes, you know, I've been a Catholic all my life. I said, yes, sir, I was a Catholic, too, before I was saved. And he said, um, well, I don't really know if I'm saved or not, but I want that Bible. I gave him the Bible. This the green Bible, but yay big, way wide, eight and a half by eleven, I guess. I gave it to him. He took it, thanked me, shook my hand, and uh, we got to, we got to become very good friends in the block. Now that was a lost man, and the, it's the way the influence started with that lost man was with what the bumper stickers had. Uh, obviously, there was gossip going on in the block, and God knows what they were saying. I could care less, but the word of God will not return void. And some of you, you have an influence here tonight. You have an influence, and you don't know and you don't think you do. You have an influence. Mothers, you have an influence. You have an influence washing those toilets, mopping those floors, cleaning that carpet, the one that always has the stains on it, amen? It just, that stain just never seems to come out. That's the that's worst stain. It just doesn't come out, amen? And you have a wood floor, and it always seems that it has to be swept up. It just keeps getting crumbs on it because the kids just can't help to be messy. <laughs> Someone's watching you through that labor. They're looking at you. They're seeing you, where you're at. They want to see how you respond under stress. They're watching you, boy. They're watching you if you read your Bible. Well, Mom, you don't read yours. Why should I read mine? Well, that's not what they say to us now, but when they're 12 and 14, they will. How about you? You know, we can look good on a, on a church, but how are we behind closed doors? You know, we're in a closed-door Christianity. We all look good on the outside, but when we get home, it's hell on wheels. The screaming and going on in the house like you were lost. Back and forth like animals. That stuff, Lord, ain't in that. Still, small, quiet voice. Studying to be quiet. And I'm a New Yorker and I'm loud. And the Lord's dealing with me about being quiet. And I want to get to that point. Regardless of my disposition and how God's used forming me in my character. It's one thing to preach, but it's one thing also to be quiet. God's into those things. You know, you've got it. Parents, you have an influence. Fathers, you have an influence also. Kids are watching you. You, not, and you shouldn't all rest and rely on the wives. The wives shouldn't have to bear the brunt of everything. I understand. You come home, you got tremendous pressures on you. But the kids are saying, is daddy home yet? While you're down there street preaching at 10 o'clock at night. There's nothing wrong with street preaching. I'm all for it. But the small thing that God asked you to do, you're not doing. It's just a small thing. And you're saying, well, I'm being faithful. You're as, about as faithful to what God called you to do in that small thing as Goliath was. God's looking for those things. You know, he'll, he takes note of the little tiny things. He takes note of the person that does the janitor work in this church. And that's the most overlooked person in this, in this church. You know that? And whoever you are, God bless you for your faithfulness. God bless you, brother and sister. And God bless the brother who takes care of the maintenance around here. And you over, he's overlooked a lot of times, but you know something? God doesn't overlook you. Just don't despise it. Eventually, the Jews ended up getting rebuilt. Prosperous people, they're industrious people, and God built them back up. And sure enough, they get built back up. And the preaching was effective. And Zechariah did his job, and Haggai did his job. And the temple got built, and Zerubbabel did his job. And you know what? The people got encouraged. There's an influence, and you don't want to despise your influence with anybody. You don't want to despise any of your influence. Because by despising your influence and despising the things that God shows you to do, He's not going to give you bigger things to do, folks. He won't give you 
a ministry of 500 if you're not faithful with a ministry of five. Head bowed and I close. Father, thank you for this word. Please bless the message to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.